Yep. Three. Wait a second. Yep, go. Hi, folks. Welcome. We're a few minutes behind. Jake dropped the camera just as we were about to go live. I think it's working. Yes, I need a haircut. I know. Tonight's topic is cabinet is dur dur durs. Furn furniture. I was going to say furniture and doors at the same time. Furniture doors. Uh, just as by way of interest, because I know you'll be interested. We uh, have our second class, which we actually is class number 15 of the Purple Heart Project. And they are arriving tomorrow night. So we're going to do an hour tonight, and we're going to do the other hour next Thursday, live here with, this, with the students. We'll get a chance to chat with them. We did that last time, and everybody loved it, so we're going to do it again. So we spent today getting the shop ready, the classroom ready, and uh, never enough time. Question, Frick? Uh, sure. This one comes from Come in, this one comes from Ernie Stillman in Hampton, Maine. Paul. Push. Okay, push. <laughs> <laughs> Ernie in May in Maine. Yeah. He says, "Do you recommend your neighbor? You re do you recommend finishing a solid wood center panel before assembly for the door?" Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to, but it's a lot. The uh, advantage is that solid wood panel. Well, you can even see it here. So this panel is going to shrink, and at some point, you'll see it here. If you don't pre-finish it, it'll show up unfinished right in here on the sides. Um, so that avoid prevents that. Now, having said that, it's going to oxidize too. So there's definitely going to be a mark. The biggest advantage is probably um, it just prevents glue from accidentally grabbing the corners and creating a, a situation where the panel is no longer floating. It's still you still have to finish. You still have to spray it once it's assembled because the frame hasn't been sprayed. But at least you get that part of it. So at least one coat is always wise. Next question, Frick. Okay. Next question comes from uh, Cleveland Redinger. Oh, Cleve. I, I talked to Cleve just not too long ago. Yeah, he's in Kansas. Cleve? He says, Rob, as a beginning woodworker, I got an inexpensive set of scissor hinges and have not used them yet. Do you ever use them? And if so, can you address the technique and let us know, uh, let us know where you get your hinges? Oh, scissor hinges. I'm not 100% sure what you mean by scissor hinges. Uh, if you're talking about those ones that mount at the top and at the bottom. Um, I don't know if I've, I think I've actually used them one time. They were a pain. Uh, that's why I've never used them again. Uh, where are you gonna get good hardware? Um, wow, I get most of my stuff from Woodcraft. Uh, where else do we buy hinges from? Richelieu? Yeah, but I don't know if they have access to Richelieu in the United States. Richelieu.com. What? Is it? Yeah. International? Well. R Richelieu probably has the largest selection of everything related to furniture, both cabinets and furniture. That's R-I-C-H-I-L-I-E-U dot com. That's probably your best bet. As far as those, that, those scissor hinges, if that's what you meant, I've, I've only done them once and it was back in university and that was so, <coughs> so long ago. I can't remember. Next, Rick. Yep, next one. <clears throat> next one comes from Dave McKibben in Minnesota. Hi, Dave. He says, there are so many hinge design types. Do you have a favorite type that you like the most? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of the, uh, the cheating way, but they offer such a huge advantage. So 32 mil hinges that you can install. You do, what size? Inch and three-eighths diameter hole. It's nice, it's nice clean look. You can take a door off so easily. You just click, click, and it's out. They've really improved over the years. They used to be, this is a different style, so I'll talk about that in a second. The hinges used to go on with a, well, they already held in place with a screw, a single screw. And the problem was that the screws, it always came loose. You go into somebody's house and you open up the door and it's almost falling off. These 
click on so there's a little latch right there so they never they never come loose they come on and off that easy you've got tons of adjustment when you put them on you can adjust uh, you can adjust in and out up and top down. and bottom up and down this way and obviously this way and in and out yeah. no I already said in and out is that is that it you can move the whole door over this way you can slide it back this way you can go up you can go down you can go in you can go out I don't think I, just fantastic and you and they come in several distances I, I usually almost always only use the flush mount and then you have these ones which actually we're working on this right now in the online <coughs> workshop so these ones that come all the way back like that so that you can pull you can pull the uh, drawers out now these are monsters and they're expensive but they again offer tremendous flexibility now this one what we did we did a youtube video on mounting so this is a traditional hinge that's mortised and the only thing about that is it's got to be precise there's not a whole lot of adjustment that you can make after the fact i mean you can always say in fact i had to do this i think we had to take the hinge out and mortise that deeper so we could close that gap i like to have it fairly close and what other side and then of course there's the wooden hinge do we have anything in here that has a wooden hinge on it no cabinet ken's, wise ken's cabinet in there but can't, can't go there can't get at it so i ha i have used uh, my own wooden hinge there's an example over here this is a this is a uh, project that we're going to make a video on building a tool cabinet so this is using a piano hinge now this is just a prototype but that certainly is probably the strongest just because you have the greatest amount of contact between the hinge and the door and and, and uh, that's and those doors are going to have tools on them so that's why we use the uh, piano hinge and I've done st I've done ones where you just the door was sitting in a frame so you would you would put a pin up through here and a pin down through here but you have to allow proper clearance in there in order for it to open the uh, but the, uh, the European style hinges are probably the most convenient they don't always fit in with a piece of furniture however in fact um, I'm trying to think what's the other what other piece of furniture have we built that has doors other than shop furniture have we got anything here well I don't think we're gonna have anything here they don't have much here what do, what do we use oh uh, there's no, no hinges on that no doors on that I would if I was building a piece of furniture I'd almost use brass there's, but, but there's the like sliding that. doors on that thing back there yeah that's not a hardware option <laughs> That's it. Next, Frick? Uh, yep. Next one comes from Dean Clark in Edmonton. Hi, Dean. Edmonton, Alberta? Yes, sir. Go Oilers. Only I don't think we're going to go very far. Find out tonight. Uh, what's the best style of door to try for a new woodworker? What is the best style of door to try for, for a new woodworker? Okay, so I assume... He's talking about, let's give you some examples. So, so this is called a frame and panel. So you have a frame, this happens to be mitered. And that is a three quarter inch wood frame. It's three quarter by two and a bit. It's what two is and that? a quarter. You sure? Put money on it? Yeah. Oh, too bad, it's just under two and a quarter. You lost. So it's, that's a frame, it's a very stable frame. It doesn't expand this way, it doesn't expand that way inside you have a solid wood panel and that panel sits in a groove on four sides so it can move this way and that way and the, the frame the opening is uh, the uh, outside dimensions of the door stay the same this allows movement without disturbing that and then you have the same over here by the way that's a flat panel so this is a frame and panel as well only in this case these are mortised so instead of a miter this is mortised into this piece which is probably more what i would consider to be more traditional but again you have a solid panel again it's a flat panel same example over there uh, if you look over here 
behind moose. This is um, a fielded panel. Some would call it a raised panel. Same idea. I didn't make these. You've got a frame that goes all the way around. Now this is a big door, so they put an extra one in here, an extra rail. And then this is a solid wood panel, but this one has a profile on it, which just is a little more complicated. And the worst thing about that is having to sand a profile like that. It's a pain in the rear end. Same idea, solid wood, allowed to float. Then you have the option of doing something with this. This door is a, a slab, so it's a piece of MDF that has veneer, mahogany veneer on both sides. And then I ran, a, I um, glued a frame all the way around it, but it, there's no, it's not considered a frame and panel, even though it's kind of built that way, but it's, it's, it's not. And you could do that, you could just take a piece of plywood and you could put a solid band all the way around. You don't think you want to see the edge of the bare edge of the plywood. That's kind of amateurish. Uh, so you've got a, pa a slab, you've got a frame and panel. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. I can't think of What's that one over there? anything else. Well, the that's panel? a frame and panel as well. So then you can just get into the different styles of panels. You can make them flat, you can make them raised, they can actually protrude up above the frame, which has a different look altogether. What would I recommend if you're just getting started? Mm, I think I would go right to the frame and panel, something like that. This is actually pretty easy to make the frame. It doesn't require complicated joinery. Mortise and tenon is not what I would call complicated. If you want to make it maybe a little simpler, you can do a flat miter and I've run a spline, so the miter was made, glued together. Once the glue dried, I went in and I ran it over the table saw on a, on a 45 degree angle. So doors tilted up like this. Cut a slot through the joint and then glued in a piece of wood and the, the grain on the, spl on the uh, spline runs this way. So that really strengthens the joint, gives you lots of extra glue surface. And of course, you're cutting a groove you're cutting a groove on the inside of all of these pieces and the panel obviously fits down in there. You can make this a skinny panel. If you've got a quarter inch groove, you can put a quarter inch panel. What I prefer to do is actually use a thicker panel. This one is probably half an inch. So if you can see, I cut a rabbit all the way around the panel on the inside so that it's, it's just a nice flat panel on this side, set down in and that always, anytime you do different depths like this, it just creates I think a little more um, interesting look. So that's what I would recommend. And it, like I said, it's not hard. Uh, I'll give you a couple of tips. Make sure you have a good sharp plane and a shooting board. You want everything, you want all these joints to be nice and tight and you want everything to come out nice and square. Meaning the edge of your, the edge of the, these are called styles. These are called rails. You want everything to be square. You want this edge to be nice and square. You want the end of this piece to be nice and square. So when the joint goes together, it's tight here and it's tight on the other side as well. You have to find a way to strengthen that joint. You can use dowels, probably the simplest, um, not the greatest, but the simplest. You could run a spline in there. You could run, you could run a groove all the way down this piece this one, this one, this one, and then actually just make a cut a tongue, cut a tongue on this one that fits into that groove. Make your groove a little bit deeper. I've done that before. It's kind of a fast and easy way of doing it. Now, let me see. I will use my pencil and uh, give me a piece of tape so I don't write on the door. So what I did here, this is, this is probably the easiest for a beginner. So I cut a groove a quarter of an inch deep, quarter of an inch wide, sorry, in this piece. But then I go back after I've cut, I cut all of them. So I've got my, got my saw set up. So I'm cutting a quarter inch wide groove, let's say a quarter of an inch deep. Got my fence set. I'm going to stand the piece on its edge and I'm going to cut groove in this piece. I'm going to cut a groove in this piece, this piece, and this piece. Now I'm going to purposely leave these two pieces longer than I need. After I've done all of that, I'm going to raise the blade up 
and I'm going to come in and I'm going to cut. Is that little red thing? I'm going to cut the groove deeper in this piece so it'll end up looking something like that. That'll be the shape of it where it stops. I'm going to do the same thing top and bottom. Then I would go ahead and I've cut a core, I, I would go in and I would cut uh, the end of this piece so that it gave me a tongue that was say three quarters of an inch long and that would fit into here. Now this, even though the panel's going to stop right about here, that doesn't matter that there's a gap there at all. But that's easier than going in and chopping a mortise. You just do it with the table saw. Now the only thing different about this is that you would see it at the top. When you look down, you would see something that looks like You see something that looks like this when you look down from the top. Right? That would be the, the tongue from this piece extending through. But there's no, no big deal. You, it allows you to clamp here and here. You're, you're going to clamp on the edges of your style. And that'll squeeze the tongue that's on that rail. And you get a good strong joint. Probably the easiest fancy door to start off with. That's my recommendation. Next, Kirk. Get that moose. All right. Next one comes from. Uh, Gotta watch the time because we're short tonight. Yeah. Next one comes from uh, Tom in Germany. Hey, Tom. But I can see Deutsch. Mortise, mortise chisels are hard to get these days. What is a good alternative to Lee Nielsen? Except IBC, thanks. <laughs> well, he's not a plant. Um, except IBC? There isn't any. Um, um, before IBC started making them, the only option you really had was Lee Nelson. I didn't like any of the others. They were always, um, they were always an out of square parallelogram. No. Yes. No, they were. No, they were. They were shaped. Oh well, yeah. Some shape. some were shaped like this on purpose. A lot, a lot were shaped. Oh, watch this visual aid. A lot were shaped like this, right? Problem with that is when you set it down on your line, it would be all cockeyed. So Lee Nelson was the only company that was actually doing it right. As far as I'm concerned, I don't have any Lee Nelsons in here. I thought I did. What do we do them? Anywhere. But he's, uh, he's, he's way behind in production. A lot of issues. They're coming back online. So I went out. We, how, how long do we work with IBC to get these? Two years. Two years? Yeah. Oh, you're being nice. So these are, these are done right. And I cannot give you, I do not know. If I, if I did, we'd, we'd have sourced them before then, before now. Because it was always a big issue when we teach classes, we didn't have mortise chisels for the vets. Lee Nelson was kind enough. He used to give us two, vet, two chisels for each vet each time we taught the class. But then when COVID hit and their production really dropped off, uh, this last class, we were, we'd have been sunk if it hadn't have been for IBC doing them. So I, I honestly, and I'm not doing that because we sell IBC. I'm doing that because I don't know of any other brand that I would even bother with. Next, Frick. All right, next one comes from uh, David Potter in Poughkeepsie, New York. Hey, David, we've, we, we've, uh, we know, say it again. Poughkeepsie. 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 What is your ideal thickness for the components of a frame? You guys, you know, have an, you have the eighth natural wonder in the world, I'm sure you know. He lives in, uh, where does he live? Um, Oxbow. Oxbow. Also known to his friends as, as Super Dave. No. Super, the goat. Super goat. Super goat. Super goat Dave. He said, he said, I don't know where those Lee Nielsen chisels went, but you certainly never sent them to me. Yeah, he's on? I yeah. assume so. That's right. Danny. Hey, Danny boy. Big shout out to Danny Bell. Danny Bell saved our bacon. Danny was our assistant two weeks ago in the class. We had him on standby for this week, but Luther got better quick. So this, uh, this week, we have Kyle Perel coming from Newfoundland. Kyle was one of the first two Canadian vets we had. He and Jesse Rufians. Jesse's over in, 
in Nova Scotia now. Jesse actually makes some of the products that we sell. Big shout out to Jesse and his family. And Kyle, who should be on his way, looking forward to that. Haven't seen Kyle in a long time. Um, who, what was I? Oh, what was the question? Well, you interrupted. Oh, he's in New York. In po po say it again. Poughkeepsie. Poughkeepsie. You ready? Uh, I'm ready. What is your ideal thickness for the components of a frame and panel cabinet door? Well, ideal. Um, I mean, typically, if you start with the frame, your frame pieces are going to be three quarter. I can't think unless it's a big door. Or smaller. Well, that's true. Small door. Have we done anything small? Well, you did those little. What, well, here, what, what's this one? That one's bigger than the one on your bench, though. That one is. What's on my bench? No, those benches out there. That bench right there. Oh, those little ones? Yeah. Well, I let think me go grab I think they were five eighths. I'll grab one. Keep talking. Can you hear me if I'm talking out here? Yep. Jake, can you come out here and film? I think I can. You still have us? Okay. So I'm I'm doing this uh, this little set of cabinets. There are cabinets for underneath the the Cosman workbench. So I had to make this proportionately properly sized. So this little door. Well, there's at least a three quarter. They might be a little less than three quarter. No, they are three quarter. That seems. Yeah. And I'm looking at it now and I'm thinking, yeah, you know what, if I did it again, I probably would have taken that down to an inch and three quarter. And if you're wondering, well, how do I know that or how did I determine that? Well, I just kind of stand back and look at it and think it just looks, there's a, I wish I could describe this for you better, but there's a proportion of the size of the frame, pardon me, the size of the panel to the size of the frame. And in hindsight, I made these a little bit too wide. I would have liked to have taken a quarter of an inch, maybe even three of an inch off of the length, uh, pardon me, the width of these. And I think it might have fit that just a little bit better. By the way, these drawers are designed to be accessed from both sides. And we have a magnet in there and there's a magnet in there. So when you close the drawer, it stops it right there. Actually, it's supposed to stop right there. But then depending, it doesn't matter which side you're, where you're working from, and there's a door on the other side as well. So I'm not sure why I did that other than just to make it so it was real easy to get at. So didn't really answer the question, so let's see if we can tackle it again. I would say that 90% um, of the time, the stock is going to be three-quarter. I just think especially on what I would call furniture sized doors. You don't really want it any bigger than that. No reason to make it any bigger than that. The, um, I, all, I do like to make my rails wider than my styles, and I just think it looks a little bit better. Sometimes when they're the same width, uh, it just doesn't seem to. You don't do that when they're mitered though. No, I don't do it when they're mitered, but on a typical frame like this, which is, which is more of what you would expect in a door, I like to make these a little bit wider. It also gives you a little more surface area in here and a little more shoulder room here, which makes for a little stronger frame. So if I were to give you these dimensions, if they are two and a, I gotta put my glasses on. Uh, I can't get away without them. So that's two and a sixteenth, and this is two and a half. And, um, yeah. I always go back and second guess myself. That probably could have gone two and three quarter and it would still would have been all right. And then the panel, dimensions of the panel. If you want to light, the nice thing about that is if you want, if it's a big door and you want to lighten it up, the panel doesn't have to be very strong at all. It's just filling an opening. So if you make your, your rails wider than your styles, then you've got a really, it makes for a really strong joint in here just because of the extra room. And the more shoulder room you have on here, the more you have, uh, the better chance you're not going to rack. And now you just have to fill this big opening. Well, that panel can be, I wouldn't go any less than a quarter of an inch, but you don't have to worry about it moving, right? It's all, it's trapped on all four sides. This one, just for the sake of handling it. Actually, that's not true. Uh, well, I, did, I cut this, I didn't want it, to, I wanted it to purposely set in here. 
So that means I couldn't use three quarter because I'd have material sticking out beyond here. So I probably cut this down to half inch. But what I went in is I just I hand planed both panels. And in the process of doing that, you may make it a little thinner on one side than the other, but it doesn't matter. You just take your best panel and then you cut the rabbit on the opposite side, referencing off of this side. So when it fits in there, if it's a little bit wider or a little bit thicker in one corner than, than the other, you can't tell. You just see a little bit of a reveal all the way around in there. The, the question you asked me was a little bit difficult to answer because it's going to be different with every one, but uh, let's go down here and take a look at these. We did doors on the uh, on this little cabinet. Now these are these, uh, and I everything is mitered just because I started doing that, so I fi I figured I would do it on all the do all the doors, with the exception of one I just showed you, and that was because that was a YouTube project where we were doing a, a standard door. So this is a nice proportion, and these are two inch. So for that size, the frame is two inch all the way around. Again, mitered as opposed to a butt joint. And, and I like the flat panel. And I just, I played around with that so you can see that it's the same piece of wood. I just resawed it. Resawed it and then glued it back together in here so you kind of have that knot on both sides. Double spline on here. So that's even stronger. See that? Excuse me. Okay, next question, Frick. Uh, well, before we... Uh, oh, it's 7.30. Well, before... I'm not ready for Kevin yet either. I'll do one more question. But I did want to uh, give a shout-out to Jason, who just donated the full scholarship for a vet. Awesome, Jason. Where is he from? Uh, Gina just sent me the... doesn't say. He, he might have been in the class before. Jason, Jason Cran. Cran. Cran, sorry. Yeah. So he just donated... That's fantastic. Full scholarship, which is Thank over $4,000. Thank, Thank you, Jason. Thank you. That's huge. And um, that'll be spread out over a bunch of vets, but you know what? You get it. Thank you. All right, so Danny in Queensland, Australia. Danny in Australia? Yeah. Go ahead, do your Australian accent, Moose. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably offensive. It's, you, you lose too many people. <laughs> What is a serviceable corner joint for a lightweight cabinet door made with half inch by one and a half inch frame stock and a uh, quarter inch ply panel? And how would you attach the panel to the frame? Okay, detailed question. And my uh, only thing shorter than my memory is my height. So let's do that one again. Okay, I'm writing it down, go ahead. Uh, okay, so what is a serviceable corner joint? Corner joint. With uh, half inch by one and a half inch frame stock and quarter inch ply panel. And a quarter inch plywood panel. How big? Doesn't say. It's, it's fairly small. I mean, inch and a half. And these are two inch. So, I'll, I, actually, we just covered that, but I, I'll cover it again. So, let's look and see what we have here. We did a single spline on these. And on these, I use a, uh, was that plywood, Jake? Yeah, Baltic yeah. Birch. Baltic Birch plywood. Keep going. That's one, one, uh, one spline. Probably plenty strong enough, but I'll give you some options. So if we come over For, here. Yeah, so a corner joint, right, Fred? Yeah. Is uh, it mitered? Yeah. What is a serviceable corner joint? Well, I'll do both. So again, this is a single spline. Not a lot of stress on that one because this is glued to the panel all the way around. Um, this is the one where we did a double. No, nope. another single spline. And again, that's, that's the simple way. One spline, now, but I wanna show you, this is the one where we did, with, this, was a, uh, this was a project in the online workshop, so we did, through wedge tenons and the whole deal. So here's a double spline. So uh, if somebody's good at uh, physics, if you figure out the leverage involved in this joint, it really, uh, it really makes it for extremely strong because of where the fulcrum is and where the load is. And it's not a whole lot of extra work. 
this is all glued up, and then you run your table saw through it. You have to use a, you have to use a rip blade, and that gives you a flat bottom. And then I always have to go in and hand plane these splines to get them to fit just right. If they're too wide and you force them, then what happens is it's going to uh, it's going to make it stick out here. So you want it to fit in there just right, so you're able to get glue in there. And you put the two of them on. And I could have used contrasting wood if I wanted to. In this case, I used I used uh, Douglas fir, which is the same as the panel. And you see the uh, the longer uh, the summer wood and spring wood, which just really stands out. So that makes that's probably the strongest. That would be, I think, the strongest way of doing it, reinforcing a miter. Um, other ways that you could reinforce a miter that would be easy. Ugh. I mean, you can dowel it, but that's a pain. Um, I don't have a sample Why? here. Why are you talking about reinforcing a miter? Because he's talking about reinforcing a corner joint. No, sir, this, what are the serviceable corner joints? What, what did, what, ask the, what's the question, Frick? What is a serviceable corner joint for a lightweight cabinet door? Serviceable corner joint for white, okay, so what's wrong? Based on those dimensions. Well, you're, ta you're, you're going on about different ways to strengthen a miter. He just wants to know what would be a good joint for those dimensions. Why don't you give me the camera and, let you, and you answer the question? This doesn't fit you. Oh, okay. Too short. So this one, uh, do you remember this? What was it? What, what do you mean? Well, I don't remember. Do it's I? It's a mortise and tenon. I know it's more and tenon, but it's, it's not. Uh, yes, it is. It's haunched. So this one, the groove. This one has a uh, the tenon comes out here, goes in, comes back and then right, has a little that. tab right here so that it fills the groove that was cut to house the panel. So if you were to look underneath, it also gives you even more. So it's all, the more contact you have in, across the width, the less it's going to be able to twist like that. And it fills that groove so you don't have to stop the groove. So I would say, uh, I, I, I stay away from dowels. They, they, never, they never work. I suppose they work, but they're just a lousy joint. I would either go mortise and tenon, tongue and groove, or a spline if you do a miter. There, could have answered the question a lot quicker. But, what now, Frick? Well, is there a particular joint you'd recommend for that dimension? Or would it just be fine because it's all proportional to its size? Uh, you could, well, yeah, I mean, it, oh, it's only half inch thick, too. Oh, Jake just hurt me over. Well, I don't know why you went down that. Yeah, well, because I, I, was thought of, I forgot about it not being three quarters. So you're only a half an inch thick. So if you're half an inch thick and you're going to do a mortise and tenon, in order to divide that half inch up into three equal spaces, what do you got, Moose? What's, what's a half inch divided by three? Three, uh, three, three sixteenths is a less little less than three over. sixteenths. It's a little over. So percent. you're somewhere between an eighth and three sixteenths, which means your tenon is going to be really skinny, right? So we talk about dividing it in a third, so this is in plan view looking down. This is your this is your piece that is measuring a half an inch. So you've got, uh, we'll just call it so a, a strong eighth of an inch here, what if and a strong eighth of an inch here, and a strong eighth of an inch here. So that doesn't make for very strong. I would think that your best bet. What if he did a quarter inch mortise? A quarter inch tenon, because his plywood's quarter inch. Well, yeah, but then if you put a quarter inch, then you've only got an eighth of an inch on either side. So there's your there's your mortise, and you've only got a quarter of an inch, and you've only got an eighth of an inch on either side. I would think your strongest joint for something that size would be to miter the corner, and use a double spline or a single spline. That's be, that's. What's that game show? What do they say? Final That's answer? Final answer. Final answer. Holy smokes, we took a long route to get there. All right, okay. so Kevin's on the phone whenever you're ready for it. Kev, you there? Just put it, no, you can't move the phone. My goodness. I can't move the phone. The microphone is there, so just put it on speaker. Yeah, uh, I, 
Kev? So we don't, we don't have video? No. Do you have the pictures? I will once you... Okay, so here's the deal. I'm going to introduce you, Kev. Sit tight. So Kevin Burris is a 22-year uh, combat wounded Army EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal. So Kev saw his more than his fair share of explosions and suffering from the overpressure from those explosions, over 150 of them in his career, left him with more TBIs and more, uh, more um, uh, concussions than you could possibly count. And the last one took him out of service, took him, almost killed him. Um, he had to learn to walk and talk and eat and the whole bit. So Kevin's been to our class. Kevin's come and worked the wood shows with us. He came to our class, and now he's part of our mastermind group where uh, there's four of us, and we meet twice a week via Zoom, and uh, we try to help one another uh, develop our business. So Kevin's business is twofold. He does the... Uh, he does the uh, laser engravings on, on great, great. That would be slate and granite mixed. Slate and granite. But he also is now doing ones. He has a, he has a big laser machine, a laser engraver, plus he has a big CNC, and he's making these fly boxes. So the, they're hinged, so you open them up and you have areas on both sides to keep your flies, if you're a fly fisherman. And he, we were talking on this week, and he was trying to decide whether he wanted the boxes to be all of one species, or whether he thought it would look better. Take me to one, Jake. Where? Well, that cab. I should have one right there. Uh, this one. Or whether it would look better if it was uh, uh, up here. Here's a good example right here. Now, I've always done it this way, so maybe that's why he asked me. So there's a box where everything is walnut, and here's a box where you have wenge on the ends, bird's eye on the top and on the sides. So the question is, what would be more interesting, and what would people prefer? To have these fly boxes where the lid and the bottom are the same? Are we showing them? Yep, yeah, put them up. Do we want the lid and the base to be the same, or do we want them to be all uh, different colors, contrasting colors? Which do you think would be more interesting? So we just want you to vote in the comments section. So S stands for same, and D stands for different. Or no, so that's, okay, we'll just leave that. Well, I actually put, what? I actually put uh, the five pictures you sent me, and I put numbers on the pictures so they can vote in the chat. <coughs> Okay, well, uh, then actually just comment. Comment and tell me either you like them with the same or you like them with contrasting. How's that? Kev, what do you want to add to that as far as what you're doing? <clears throat> so, I'm um, doing this, you know, at, I'm an average fly fisherman, and <clears throat> I like to fly fish and stuff, but and as a fly fisherman, we... We buy the best. We buy the best equipment, and we want the best uh, gear when we're out there fly fishing. So we buy the best poles. We buy the best gear and everything. But no one provides the best um, gear for your flies and stuff to have them. So I'm providing that by having a really nice exotic wood apply boxes and stuff so that way you have something to show off your your flies and when you catch that fish you can show off your flies and your fly box with the fish but then on the off season when you're not fly fishing it can be displayed out as art and if you're like me who tie flies you can you can put your flies in there that you tie and show it off to everybody. And they have they have brass bullet hinges and brass bullet hinges and rare earth magnet to hold them um, to hold them closed. To, to hold them closed. They're all finished with total boat halcyon clear varnish. So that's a water resistant varnish. Yes. Okay, and there's room. It's for the, the same as. And there's room for uh, lots of flies because you can put them on both sides, right? 
Yes. I think so you probably saw that in the picture. I don't see it. We weren't, we weren't, we weren't, able, to get a, we weren't able to get a video connection. We had a right. malfunction. So you you can put you can put eighty flies in there easily, and and it all depends on what what types of flies you're putting in there. Will limit the amount of flies that you'll be able to put in there, but you can easily put eighty nymphs in there, and 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 stuff. So okay, so. If they uh, if they want to see this uh, a little bit closer, they can go to Burris B U R A S Woodworking dot com. Correct. Yes. And they're up there now. How yes, and these are the and these are the large these are the large sizes and uh, they're um, four four they're four inch four inches and five eighths wide by six and seven eighths in length and they're a little over an inch and a quarter in in depth and um, those are the large sizes and within the next week and stuff the small size will be coming out which will be uh which will be three and a half inch by three and a half inch ones okay sounds perfect all right, so do us, do Kevin a favor, do me a favor, vote, tell us what you think. You saw the pictures. So Check most, out. most are saying contrast. Contrast, Kev. Uh, but a lot of people are just like both. They, they think they're all beautiful. So, But I would, have, I would have to say that uh, if I had to go by what's in the chat, uh, it's mostly contrast. Contrast is winning, Kev. All right, brother. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. See you, Kev. So while I'm on that topic real quick, so tonight, uh, I didn't even mention this, but and uh, if you're looking to uh, participate, now is a great time to donate. Prices of everything have gone through the roof. Our airfare to bring the vets in. So let me back up just a little bit in case you don't know. The Purple Heart Project is a program that we run six times a year, one a month from May to October. We bring in seven combat wounded veterans and seven civilians buy spots to come in the class. And we teach them everything they need to know to sharpen their tools freehand, learn how to plane, square a board, six sides, cut dovetails, cut through dovetails, half blind dovetails, mitered edge dovetails, um, mortise and tenon, through wedge tenon, just about everything. The skills that you learn will enable you to build a piece of furniture because everything else is just a combination of those skills. Anyway, so we're here for six days. We start uh, Monday morning at 7. We finish sometime after supper on Saturday night. For the vets, we cover their airfare, their hotel, their meals. We send every vet home with? 38. U.S.? $3,800 U.S. worth of premium tools. So essentially, a lot of what you see behind me, IBC chisels, Wood River planes, the six, the shoulder plane, or the block plane, and the five and a half, the four and a half. We sent them home with three Cosman saws, the dovetail saw, the crosscut saw, the medium tenon, uh, a, a, a PEC square, fret saw, all the prim, the uh, Shapton stones, everything. And thanks to Jeff, uh, Jack Lane down in Texas, and a big shout out to Stella, who's doing very well. She's almost three pounds. You read today, I, I, don't, I don't do ounces very well, but she's growing like a weed. So um, Jack, with the help of Chris Chahusky and now Jim Rossetti up here in Moncton, those guys run what's called the uh, Bench Brigade. And they make sure that every vet that comes to our program gets to have a bench delivered to his home so he can set up a shop in his spare bedroom, in his basement, in his garage, wherever, and they can enjoy the solace that comes from hand tool woodworking. So if you would like to participate and help, what I was going to mention was, um, starting with our last class, airfare has doubled, am I saying that correctly? It's a thousand bucks per. So it was less than $500 per ticket the last time we did a class 
in, 19, in 2019, and now it's just over $1,000 per ticket. So expenses have gone up. Food's gone up. Everything's gone up. We feed these guys premium food. Ask anybody. If, you were, if you've been to one of our classes in the chat room or in the chat, just tell them how good the food is. In fact, they all say they come back for the food, not the woodworking. But I can handle it. Um, anyway, if you'd like to participate, you can donate. You go on our site, robcosman.com. The link will be on there anyway. This is the least expensive way to donate in terms of us not paying huge fees to somebody to collect the money. And for every $1,000 we raise tonight, we're going to give away one of these gifts. So, um, what? Absolutely, we weren't doing a draw. We're doing the draw on Thursday, oh. but we will, we will take everything that we accumulate tonight and we'll add it to Thursday's total and we'll do the big draw then. But what you have a choice of is a, uh, a shave brush made by Jeff O'Connor, O'ConnorWoodworking.com, or a billy club, also known as the Irish Kiss Stick, made by the same notorious Jeff O'Connor. Uh, um, uh, Bob Abbott makes these tumbling block. Th this is really cool. This is a, uh, a cutting board. It's thick, and it makes me dizzy when I look at it. So I have to be careful when I'm cutting my bread. And Kevin does the laser engravings, or you can have one of these new fly boxes. Your choice. So we give away one of those prizes for every thousand dollars. And just so that you know, we buy these, this stuff from these guys at full retail to support their business. And then we donate it back or donate it to you guys. Well, Moose is here tonight and we don't have a dead cat up, but every night we give away three dead cat sweaters. And uh, Moose has been helping us with this for a long time. And the dead cat sweater is the garment of choice for woodworkers everywhere. Did I forget anything, Frick? And a big, a big shout out to, uh, Angie, who's at home watching. Angie and her sister Lynn are part of our team. They do all the packaging of all of our t-shirts, our Purple Heart t-shirts. And Ken's on the line, I assume. He said he was going to be. And if there's any vets out there I didn't get a shout out to, remind me. Okay. Um, duh. So Kyle's coming in from Newfoundland. Luther's on his way from Seattle. Luther comes every time. Um, if things get straightened out at the border, Super Dave will be here for the last three classes. So everybody shows up tomorrow night. We have a meet and greet uh, featuring Frick's famous frickin' good barbecue. What, what's on the menu for tomorrow night, Frick? We are going to do uh, smash burgers and smoked uh, chicken wings. Smash burgers and smoked chicken wings. That starts at 7 o'clock. Make sure you're here on time. And somebody from the Powers family will be here to introduce you to the Joe Power Memorial Workshop. Joe Power was uh, my neighbor growing up, a World War II vet, and that's who we named our shop after. Give me a question, Frick, please, and thank you. All right, this one comes from Scott Hobbs in Iowa. Hi, Scott in Iowa. He says, which do you think is easier to fit doors to, face-framed or non-framed cabinets? Well, uh, you know what, it's pretty much the same, because if it's flush mount, you're, you're, either, you're either doing this, so this is frameless, right? There's no frame on here. This is just the actual case. Or, I don't have an example, do I? Yeah, I do over here. Mm. Nah, not really. Half. So uh, a face frame would just mean that you've added a frame to the outside edge of the case, but you're still fitting the drawer to the inside. Now. Um, actually, I will say one thing about that. Your hinge option, if you're using the 32 mil hinge, these ones, I would say it's probably a little bit easier to do to fit the door to the frameless. Um, if you're going, if you have a F, F, if you have a face frame on there, yeah, the way that their mounting bracket holds on there is a little bit flimsy, er. So I would say, I would say frameless. You can, don't step on that, Jake. Mm -hmm. Next, Frick. Uh, next one comes from... Can we tell them anything about the vice no. server? Can't tell them about the vice server. The devices are almost ready and we'll be selling them real soon. No. And uh, the video we're going to release this week is going to tell them all about it. We can't tell them that? Mm. Okay. So that's the uh, Mox and Vice. We can't no, talk to you not. about that yet. What? No, it's not. Yeah. All right. Don Trust in South Park, Pennsylvania. Hi, Don. 
I've always loved the look of miter joints. Is there any good way to reinforce a miter joint that would make it viable for a cabinet door frame? Okay, next. <laughs> Rewind. Uh, Don, you're... Uh, no, no, uh, yeah. that, no. Just that's... back up a little bit. We no, talked a that's... ton about that. Frick is just asking questions that were submitted. He's asking oh. them in order. Yeah, he uh, didn't... He, this not wasn't... that he just asked that question. We have the, a guy asking the questions isn't paying attention. I, that's because I'm doing many more things. Uh, well, you're, you're, that's the feminine side of you, Frick. You're able to multitask. Yeah, all right, I'll take it. Um, Next. Jay Yokus in Cincinnati, Ohio. Hi, Jay. Our I've lap, been to Cincinnati numerous times. Are lap joints, the perf are, are lap joints prefer preferred over other methods? Uh, so a lap joint, it's easy. I don't know if it's preferred. It's pretty easy. So uh, at the end of, if this was a lap joint, um, this piece would have half of it cut out in the back. This piece would have half cut out in the front. And you would just put the two of them together so this is flush. But you'd have a joint here. And you'd have a joint line running this way on the inside. So it gives you all that much glue surface. It's a real easy, quick way of joining two pieces, of, a, of strengthening a butt joint, say that. And is it strong enough? I, the only time I would avoid that is if it's really wide because then you got, if it's cross grain construction. So if it's really, if it's wide, let's say it was four inches, now you're gonna risk the joint coming apart because you've got one piece not moving and the other piece moving, so. Now, you can take that lap joint and you can do a miter with it too. I meant to say that. You can, you, can, uh, you can do a miter that is actually a lap because what you, would, what you see here is just this. But on the back side, you would see this piece would continue down here. So half of, uh, if, if, you, if, you cut, if you imagine this piece right here, and at the halfway point in here, you cut it back to here. And then this piece, this section right here would come all the way down. So you'd have a butt joint on the inside. You'd have a miter out here. Inside face of that triangle would glue against the opposite. So it's, um, yeah, it's another way to strengthen a miter. It probably wouldn't be a, in my top three. That double spline, I think, is the strongest, as long as you don't mind seeing the spline. Most people find that attractive to be actually see how it's made. You can do that blind as well, where the splines don't come all the way through, but I prefer them to come all the way through. I'd like the look of it. Next, Frick. Um, just Lots two of time. more. Lots of time. Lots of time. We're Mike, in, no. Mike Evans in Tennessee. More. Pardon? Mike Evans in Tennessee says, hey what are the advantages or disadvantages of loose tenons compared to traditional mortise and tenon? You know what, Mike? I can't answer that. Uh, floating tenons, for some reason, seem to be popular with uh, the domino or whatever it's called. I know uh, uh, who's the guys that make the expensive Festool. Festool. Festool makes domino. And... Um, there's, this, there's the fact that you can, obviously it's easier to make if you have the machinery. Is there any difference in the strength? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, by the time the wood is glued, if you've got good long grain to long grain glue contact, it certainly isn't traditional and it's not a hand cut joint, it's power. But I, don't, I think you'd have a hard time determining one being stronger or weaker than the other especially if you consider, is it strong enough? In other words, how strong does that joint need to be? If I, if, I'm, if I can't break it by doing that, obviously, if the joint, when it does fail, means the wood, the wood breaks apart, then the joint has done its job. It has made the joint stronger than the actual wood itself. And at that point, there's nothing you can do to make it any stronger. So... I would say, backing up a little bit, I would say that, that either one would be stronger than the, uh, than the joint actually requires. But I've never done the floating one at mine, or always done the traditional way, because usually almost done with hand tools or sometimes on the table saw. Next, Frick. 
So Rick Foster in the chat. Hi, Rick in the chat. He says, my six-year-old granddaughter, Jayla, would like to know how many things you have built. This week? How m I would like to know that. Jana is her name? Uh, Jayla. Jayla. Well, let's just look in this room, Jayla. How many things have I built? The bench, one. The cabinet, two. That cabinet, three. That cabinet, four. That cabinet, five. That cabinet, six. That bench, seven. That cabinet, eight. Oh, that don't, cabinet, don't forget your fancy router table. Nine. <laughs> ten. That cabinet, eleven. Did you build that chair? Up. What chair? The one you just walked by? Twelve. That Did you count the thing up? station? Yeah, twelve. That coffee table, 13. That trusted drawer is not finished. Um, there's a, there's a, a TV cabinet over there, it would be 14. There is another chair over there, it would be 15. This thing section in here would be 16. And if we peek out there, there's another tool cabinet, it would be 17. And there's a, uh, a thing that, used, that has a bunch of drawers on it, it would be 18. And that bench would be 19. That bench you sit on, not the workbench. And all those workbenches would be 20, 21, 2, 3, 4, 30, 35, lots. Lots and lots. One more, Frank. Oh, I wasn't ready. Oh. I thought you were done. Shocker. Uh, okay, Granola John in the chat. Says, Granola John. Granola John. He's a, he's a serial guy. <laughs> he says, what is the best type of hinge? Okay, that goes back to the beginning. For a door? I guess. Okay, I, I asked John, I answered that question in the beginning. And, and I think versatility-wise, the European hinges, the good ones, I like Bloom, B-L-U-M. Uh, I think they make the best. And they've really improved those over the years. The flexibility is amazing. You don't have to see any hardware on the front if you don't want to. If you want to see hardware, then use the brass butt hinges and you get the good ones. Baruso, I think it's what it's called. You gotta pay money if you want the really good ones. The hard ones you buy at the hardware are cheap. And they got a lot of, they got a lot of slop Give in them. Give them an example of expensive ones. Price wise? Yeah. Jay, you're the one that spends all the money around here. You tell them. 30 bucks. For what? For a pair of hinges. For those, pa for those ones on there? Yeah. Those little hinges, $30? Yeah. So 15, if you're doing fifteen dollars was the cheap one. If you're doing something with a lot of drawers, that could get very expensive. Frank, are there any vets I should be saying a shout out to? Oh, I didn't keep track, but uh, name just a few. Danny's there. Yeah. Uh, Sneaky Pete is here. Uh, oh, the Jeff comment wanted vets. I don't know which. They've been to our class. Okay, don't ask. Me. Never mind. Jack Lane is there. <laughs> okay. I don't know Obviously, we didn't assign that job to the... He's too year. busy. You're busy. You're busy. I got three screens over here. You got three screens. What are you playing? Solitaire while we're doing this? Spider smoke. Spider solitaire. So let's sum this up by telling you what's going to happen. Guys all arrived. I wanted, to, I wanted to read out the list of who's coming. Shoot. What's it matter? Read it. I want to tell everybody who's here. coming. What? They're going to see them on Thursday. We'll enter some later. So Thursday night at... Uh, ESG. 7, 7 Eastern. 7 Eastern. We are going to do an hour-long special broadcast right in the middle of the class. We'll go around. We'll get anyone who wants to say something. We'll have a look at their work, see how good their dovetails are, compare them to the last class. See, oh, I also want to give a big shout-out to the last class. Um, uh, we had some guys that didn't get home because of flight cancellations. We dropped them off in Bangor on Sunday, and Wade... Big tall Wade didn't get home until Wednesday. In fact, I decided to call him Wednesday to see how he was doing, and he was just getting off the airplane. Can you believe that? They spent three days in Bangor Airport. And um, who else was late getting home? Well, Wade was the latest. Jerry was actually the earliest. Yeah, Jerry was our, uh, was our Vietnam vet. Scott was delayed. Scott was our, uh, you, you may remember Scott. Scott was the one that got blown up really bad in Afghanistan. Scott didn't get home until Tuesday. So, you guys, sorry it ended that way, but uh, I don't fly the plane, boss. No, Wade flattened his chisel. <laughs> yes, I said to Wade, so what did you do? Yeah, you got to know Bangor is about this big. And I said, I told him, I said, I'd rather get shot in the neck, which he did, than have to spend three days in the Bangor airport. What'd you do? He goes, well, 
That little table they sit, they put in there, he says, I set up my sharpening station, I did all my chisels, all my plane plates. <laughs> that might have been a hard one to explain to the maid, but I'm glad he did. I hope, and you guys need to get to work, stay busy, keep working on it, and watch these, and ask me when you have questions. I'm open to you whenever you need help. Call, text, do something, and I will uh, help guide you through. Okay. So, also a reminder to follow us if you have Instagram. Follow us on there because we post a lot of pictures and videos throughout the week. Yes. So on Instagram, how they find you, how they find us on Instagram? Uh, I'll post the link on the screen. If they the shortcut is Instagram.robcosman.com, I'll take them right to our right. Page. So throughout the week, I get Frick in here quite often, and we'll do some lives out there in the class, and you'll see what goes on, and you'll get to be part of the class. Woo! Um, the class is full. Our, uh, our June class is full. I think we sold out. We sold out the August class. The July class is sold out. The August class is sold out. The September class is sold out. I think there might be room. There might possibly be a spot in the October class if you still want to get in. And then we'll start all again next year. Anyway, thanks for being on here. We appreciate your support. Great to have you. We will see you in a matter of days. Safe travels to all the guys coming to the class. See you.